without a shadow of a doubt. We back again, man. Maybe a couple of minutes before seven o'clock, but that's okay. Cause right now you about to go into the middle of the war zone. I got my good friend Donovan Shadik. Demetri K is in the building. And tonight, they call him controversial. I just call him Tony. We got Tony Busby in the war zone tonight. So ain't no sense of playing. We finna get to it, man. Oh, man. Say, I want to welcome you guys to the War Zone. I appreciate you tuning in. And as usual, we could not do this without y'all. Um, <clears throat> how y'all doing, Demetri and Donovan and Tony? All good. Man, every All night good. we come into the War Zone, every night we come with something different. Um, I reached out to this good man and just reached out to him on Facebook. And uh, you never never know when a multimillionaire might respond to you. <laughs> so, my man responded, and we got Tony Busby in the building. How you doing, Doc? I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing what I can. I mean, it's a difficult time. I think we're all suffering through it, but yeah, I'm, I'm feeling good. Okay. Now, a lot of people, you know, I've done a lot of research on you. Um, oh, Jesus! Way, way before, <laughs> uh, way before elections and all that. I try to keep up with the movers and shakers. <laughs> and but a lot of people don't really know who Tony Busby is. Can you give them like a a, a quick bio of Tony Busby? Yeah, I think I think I hit the high points. Um, the most important thing to me is my dad. Uh, my dad was a butcher and cut meat for forty three years for Safeway Corporation. Some of you may remember that grocery store. And uh, my mother drove my school bus and worked in our cafeteria. Uh, I went to a school that was a 2A school in, in Texas. That's a uh, my little town was 1,300 people and uh, played football and that sort of thing, but had no none of my family had ever been to college. And I was able to get a ROTC scholarship from the Marines and went to Texas A&M and then went into the Marine Corps as a lieutenant, uh, went into the infantry, and then ultimately a special forces uh, recon guy and served. And we were just talking before we went live, um, uh, served in Desert Storm and then served in um, Somalia in 1993 and had a small, small bit of time in the L during the LA riots. We were just talking about um, and then, you know, when I got out of the Marines, I was a young uh, married person, no children, came to Houston and um, started, went to law school at University of Houston and did pretty good and started my own law firm. And now I represent people who have been cheated or uh, discriminated against or uh, wronged in some way. Sometimes I represent large companies now that I've had some success. And of course, I ran for mayor um, last election cycle here in Houston. Uh, we were we were just laughing. I got my face beat in by the current mayor. Uh, and he may have done me a favor because it'd be tough to be the mayor right now in any city across the country. Uh, but uh, that's that's really me in a nutshell. You know, my, I, what I care about is um, I care about animals. I care about uh, the homeless. I care about people that are that are that get the short end of the stick. Um, and you know, I've had some success and I've, I've had, I've, I've, you know, I don't know why God bless. I don't know. I've, sometimes I think I sit in my chair, um, and, and here in my house and I think about like, why, why, what did God bless me for? I don't know. I keep trying to find, find that out, but, uh, I have been blessed and, and been blessed not only for some, some success in my career, but also from all the different people that I've been able to meet, including, uh, the three that are in this show. Man, I, I tell you what, man, um, that that last election cycle was a monster. Uh, yeah. Some races I saw that 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 should have went different ways. They didn't go in the race that you ran against Mayor Turner. The one thing he just kept dropping was the fact that you did a fundraiser for Donald Trump. So that was like, OK, he he hang out with Trump. We shouldn't vote for him. 
Yeah. But I think he forgot to tell the public that you actually did fundraisers for him too. Yeah. Yeah. When when uh, the the mayor the mayoral cycle before the one I ran in, uh, and again, you know, I, being the the mayor of as far as my business is concerned. You know, the, whoever the mayor is or the county judges has no impact on my business. You know, I've got cases in California, Louisiana, New York, Texas, all over the country. And I, it doesn't matter who the mayor is, but I care about the city that I live in. You know, I raise my kids here, my business is here. Um, and so the, the election before the one I ran in, um, I was supporting uh, because he asked me to support him. Um, one of our our county commissioners now, but once once he lost and he didn't make it to the runoff, he came to me and said, "Hey, would you would you be willing to do a fundraiser in your house for for Sylvester Turner?" Now I knew who Sylvester Turner was. I mean, Sylvester Turner has been in politics for more than thirty years in the state of Texas, uh, you know, state rep and so forth, and and very active and very well known. And he's tried, you know, he had run for mayor at least two times prior. So I said, sure, just have him call me and I will uh, I, I'll try to help him out because I didn't I, his opponent was this guy, Bill King, who I didn't really care that much for. Um, and so, you know, uh, Sylvester came to my house and we had a fundraiser. And I think I hopefully I raised him a, a good amount of money and, and helped him in his election. He ended up winning, of course. Um and so, but as soon as I, I announced to run, he immediately started attacking me because I had supported Donald Trump when Trump had run for the presidency. And it was kind of, uh, it was ironic that, you know, he was attacking me for supporting Donald Trump when I had actually supported him. Um, so, yeah, you're right. Um, and, and, and it, you know, I've supported in the past, you know, I've been convinced to. I supported Donald or um, Joe Biden as an example. So, I think we're all probably thinking about who are we going to support this next election cycle. But I, I, as we talked about before the, before we went live, I, I have a good prediction of who's going to win this next one. Dimitri, be easy on me. Huh? Oh. Now. <laughs> what does that say on your shirt? It says. Thank you for leaving me alone. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's I one like of my it. favorite shirts. <laughs> okay, where'd you get that? I want to get one of those too. I, I'll do that when I go on. A, I go on these long walks all over Houston. I've walked like seven to 10 miles a day. And that would be the perfect shirt. I got it from five and below, you know, okay. the $5 store or whatever it's called. Yeah, yeah. No, I, yeah, I got it. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, well, welcome once again. And so, Thank you. um, why do you think it was such a, I guess, a nail in the coffin for you when, uh, you being associated with Trump, um, was brought up? Well, we, we did, even before I ran, I spent a little bit of money polling. I did some polling on my name ID. I did some polling on, to the extent people even knew who I were, I was, which very few people did, um, what they thought about me. I did some polling on Turner, like what people thought about him. And I did some polling on Trump because I expected and anticipated that that they would try to attack me because of my association or at least uh, thought they thought my association with Donald Trump. Donald Trump, when when I started the election, had a 59 percent extremely unfavorable um, uh, rating within the city of Houston. Now, if you expanded that Harris County, it wasn't, it, it was, it almost became favorable, but within the city itself, he had a 59% either unfavorable or very unfavorable uh, connotation, if you will. Um, and then as we, as the election went on, like when I first announced and I did a few commercials and I talked about, you know, um, you know, city hall for sale and all the stuff you may you may have seen or may not have seen, but but I had a pretty good I had a pretty good people liked me uh, more than fifty percent. I mean, which in politics that's pretty good. But um, once Sylvester started his negative campaigning, where he just tried to tie me with Trump, Trump, he pushed me below fifty percent, and I stayed below fifty percent the entire election cycle, even though I still got you know forty forty four percent of the vote. 
Um, but I, and, and that's why I say that his team was was very, very skilled and they knew what would sink me. And um, it didn't matter if, if I proved that he had, st- you know, had a bag full of cash and he took it to his house and I showed the cash and showed the bag and showed where he took it from the city. The Trump thing sunk me. Uh, there was really nothing I could do. And even when I made made it to the runoff, um, uh, my my whole team and then my look at the numbers, I, I, I spent a little bit of money in the runoff, but I knew it was a, a loss leader. I knew I, I wasn't gonna, couldn't win it. Uh, so I'll go uh, before somebody. So I did read um, that at first, I guess you were a Trump supporter, and then the uh, I guess the Access Hollywood tape came out, and then you disassociated yourself from them. And then it sounds like um, you donated five hundred thousand dollars to the inaugural, um, I guess, uh, campaign or whatever it was, or committee. Um, well, the timing of that, I mean, I, Turner was very good about trying to show, but the timing of that was. When I did the fundraiser here, I committed to his inaugural. Uh, I mean, I could have backed out of it. I mean, there's nothing legally binding me to do it. Mm-hmm. But when we did the fundraiser, uh, I actually didn't put up any money. I raised him two and a half million and I provided my house and I provided, uh, you know, obviously it costs money to throw some big event like that. But I committed to the inaugural. But I didn't think I mean, I didn't know he was going to win. I didn't think he would win. I thought it was a hoot that Donald Trump, the apprentice, you know, the head of the apprentice was at my house. Um, And so when he did win, you know, I had made that commitment. And the head of the inaugural committee said, Tony, you made that commitment. Are you going to follow through with it? Well, so I followed through with it. So it kind of looked like I supported him, didn't support him, Mm -hmm. supported him again. What actually happened was I supported him. That Access Hollywood thing came out, which my daughter, I have two, but one of my daughters who's really, you know, speaks a lot, if you will. I mean, very loud in my ear. I can't believe you were, you know, and I was like, no, well, you know, and so I I posted something on Facebook saying I think those comments were reprehensible, blah, blah, blah. But I ultimately did vote for him. I mean, I had to choose between Hillary Clinton, who I know, and and Donald Trump, who I know, and of those two, I chose Donald Trump. And then, you know, the the commitment I made, I followed through with. I mean, because hell, it was the president. So, um, so although it looks from the outside like, you know, I'm like flip flopping like a couple of flip flops. The truth was, it's just that's just kind of how it shook out. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's what it, yeah, Donovan. Yeah. Hey, uh, once again, thank you for your service. I mean, it's an honor to have you on the show. Uh, I just got a few questions and I, I, I made a, a couple comments in the comment section. Uh, when, you, when, when you see a Marine become a millionaire, that's almost impossible. What? No, <laughs> what? When a Marine becomes a millionaire, that's almost impossible. Oh, you know, man. you guys aren't educated. You guys aren't educated. James Baker, the former Secretary of State, was a Marine. I can keep going. There's a ton of them. Exactly. Then, no, no. It's just you know, I, I was Air Force, so I'm gonna tell you, I, I was in Mogadishu. We we brought in some of the uh, light infantry equipment on the C5s. What year? So 93? Uh, we were, uh, no, yeah, I think I was there late '91, uh, okay. early '92. I left there and, right uh, before that. Remember that movie Black Hawk Down? I'm sure you've seen it. Yeah. I was there like literally right before we pulled out right before that. Okay. Yeah, I was there a little bit in that area than we, than we jammed out to. But again, for those guys that, that don't know what these guys do, unbelievable be, to be a Marine. And by the way, uh, there was a, a cache of money that was missing from the base on the way to Mogadishu, and the Marines were No, I didn't get it. No, <laughs> no I but- um, I made my money the hard no, way. I sued people for it. The hard way. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, let me ask you this, because a lot of people that, you know, that don't know, because they think, you know, if you're in the Army, you know, you're just a grunt. If you're in the Marine Corps, you're just a grunt. Now, you had an opportunity to choose between any of the branches of service. What made you uh, choose to be a Marine versus, you know, maybe the Air Force or the Navy or something like That's that? That's a great question. Um, I, I'm i just one of those kind of people that always, like, chooses the the tough route. I mean, that's just how I am. Like, you know, even, even in the Marines, when I finished first in my training, 
uh, my initial training. So I had the opportunity to choose any specialty I wanted. I could have been a fly boy. I could have flown, you know, the fancy jets and all that stuff. I chose to be an infantry officer. You know, we, I used to say grunts pound the ground. You may have heard that. Um, and, uh, and then even in the infantry, I tried out and was ultimately selected to reconnaissance unit, which is Marines don't say special forces like they do in army and, 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 you know, seals in the Navy, but, but it's equivalent to like, you know, you know, this, um, seals or whatever. In fact, they train on at Coronado Island, which is where they train the steel seals. Um, so I did that my first, after my first tour, I tried out for, and was selected to become a reconnaissance officer. Um, and I just, I just, that's my mentality. And that's kind of in my law practice. I'm always seeking out those tougher cases with more risk, but more reward. And, um, it's kind of my mentality. Maybe that's the reason I ran for mayor and got my, got law, you know, got beat up. But, um, but uh, that's just how I, I, I operate in my life on a daily basis. Sorry. But thank you for your service too. I, you know what I always say about that is that when people thank you for the service, I, I, I thank the Marine Corps for what they did for me because I got a lot more out of the Marines than they got out of me. And and that's the key. That's the key because they're going to get theirs. Yeah, they're, they're going to get there. there. Sure. Now, a lot, a lot of people don't know that you know they they just hear the, the lawyer and all that. But there's a there's a giving side to you. Um, I know about the the bike giveaways you do every year. I think it's like a thousand bikes you give away for for Christmas and different things like that. Yeah. Can can you tell folks some? I mean, because some days. In guys in your position, they don't like to talk about it. They just do it. And I respect that. Yeah. But sometimes you got to toot your own horn because a lot of people don't know what you do some days. So before they can judge Tony Busby, let's find out how many times he's actually helped the community. Well, I really appreciate you saying that. And you're, you're 100 percent right. It's like, you know, I don't go around talking about that. Um, when I was a kid and um, my father, like I said, you know, my father made a, a big impact on me. Um, we had, we grew, we grew, we had a huge garden and we had pigs and chickens and guineas and, and ducks and geese. And we had a little one acre farm, but we, 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 uh, you know, we worked very, very hard. I was out there digging potatoes or, or cutting okra or, pulling carrots. Um, but we used to take, you know, you can only, you know, fresh vegetables and fruits and so forth. You know, you can can a lot of it, but eventually you're probably going to have to give it away or sell it. And my dad used to take us, and I'm talking about in the backwoods of East Texas. Um, we would go to like places, people out in the middle of the country that had no running water, had no uh, indoor plumbing, had no electricity. And we would bring big baskets of fresh fruit and vegetables to them. And my, you know, old lady dipping snuff, you know, with snuff running down her lip. And my dad would say, hug her neck, boy, hug her neck. And, you know, I'm just like a kid. And I'm just like, you know, I got to go hug this lady's neck. But she's got snuff running down her face. And, and he really impacted on me how important it is because we weren't I mean, we weren't well off. I mean, we, my, I remember I used to. We lit, we had a three bedroom house. It was 1400 square feet and the walls were so thin. I could hear my parents talking at night about, you know, which bill they could pay, which bill they couldn't pay. You know, they were kicking it, kicking the can down the road to try to try to make ends meet, living paycheck to paycheck. You know, they bought everything on credit. A lot of people have never even heard of layaway. You know, we would go to Kmart and do layaway for Christmas gifts and, when the blue light special, some people don't ever heard of that, but my mom used to hang out at Kmart waiting for the blue light special so we could run over there and, and take advantage of that, you know, 10% discount or whatever the devil it was. But my parents impressed upon me the importance of, look, if you, you know, if you have some degree of success, you got to give something back. And I've had a, I've really worked hard and with my children to try to impress upon them the same thing. And so when you talk about the bike giveaways, we used to what we used to do was we would we would give away a thousand or two thousand bikes every other year. 
and we would have a Christmas party for my firm and for my, you know, you probably heard about the Snoop Dogg party and all that. That's like the off year. The more, the more fun things we had did was give away bikes. What I've been doing recently is uh, giving away vans, uh, handicapped accessible vans to the Houston Children's Charity. I've given away 15 wow. so far. And if you could just see the face of these families, m many times these are families where the, the, the mother uh, of the handicapped, and we're talking about severely handicapped children, has, has abandoned a child or left them with a, 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 a foster parent or left them with a grandparent. And they're very, you know, it takes a 24 hour care. And these folks who are trying to take care of these children are homebound because they just can't leave because they have to provide 24 hour care. And you provide them a van where they now can take this child to the park or take, take this child, you know, out around, out and around Houston, the look on their face. And I, so I bring my children to that where we give away these keys to these vans and they can go outside and see the van. And now all of a sudden they're mobile and they can take their kid around who's, you know, and you, know, you think about, you know, on the one hand, obviously they're completely devoted to that child. On the other hand, they feel like they're kind of resentful because I, you know, I'm just stuck here and you provide them some degree of, of mobility. Uh, that makes me think back to going back in the backwoods, giving somebody a basket of fruit and a, and a new turkey and a, a ham to give them some food and some fresh fruit. And that was all impressed upon me by my father. So over the years, I've always, I'll give you another example. Uh, I used to collect a lot of exotic cars. I mean, I, growing up poor, you know, I used to wear plastic shoes and rustler jeans. And I'm sure some of the viewers understand what I'm saying. And, you know, my, my friends in school, you know, had Levi's, which I never could afford, or had Nikes. God bless Michael Jordan. I didn't afford that stuff, but they had them. You know, so when you get to a point where you can have that, how many more, how many like Levi jeans can I buy? How many, how many more Nike shoes do I need? I don't really need that. But, but I get a lot of pleasure out of, out of, you know, giving things to people that, that, um, that, can't or can't or ha have not had that opportunity in 2000 and I think it was 13 or 12. I had accumulated like 14 or 15 cars like Lamborghinis and Aston Martins and really fancy cars. You know, I was really, and one of my, one of those days, my, my son said to me, Hey dad, my, my, my buddy wants to know what car are you driving to work today? It stuck, it stuck in my head. And I was like, no, nah, I don't want my son to be. That's not that's not my son. That's not what I want my son to be talking to his buddies about. So I contacted a, a homeless charity out of Galveston. I said, look, I'm going to give you all these cars. Tell me what you're going to do with these cars. And I gave away every car that I had. I put them on, put it at auction and gave all the money to a homeless charity out of Galveston, which completely changed that charity. I mean, they had a they had a. a, a a, a large amount of money that they could use to do their mission, which was to help people that are down and out on their luck. So that's kind of what really makes me happy. Like in, in the law practice, as an example, um, I don't do it because, you know, I want to make more money. I mean, people think that I'm, I'm, I can understand, you know, people's uh, thoughts on lawyers and they think, you know, there's a bunch of greedy uh, sharks. Um, I do it because I like to square accounts. I like when somebody has been cheated or wronged. I like to be the guy that shows up and says, "Uh, uh you're not going to do that to this person anymore. And we're going to we're going to fix this. Uh, that's where I get a lot of my pleasure uh, and kind of what drives me to do what I do. And that's the reason I ran for, to be honest, that's the reason I ran for mayor. It wasn't I didn't I didn't have any uh, you know, I don't care about galas and going on trips and representing the city of Houston and this thing and that, and, you know, being the the mayor and people like wanting to come up and show what I was more, what would give me more pleasure was, was to uh, find out who had been cheating the city, the, the citizens of the city, find out who had been not getting the services they were entitled to find out who had been palms have been greased to get this and that when it shouldn't happen. Uh, you know, that's what I was going to turn. I was going to, like Jesus said, you know, when Jesus turned out the money changers, that's what I was wanting to do. I was really motivated by that. And um, um, 
that's kind of what that's kind of the fire that's in my belly. And and the, the good news for me is, is it's still there. I mean, even after the mayor campaign, I got beat up pretty bad. My family got beat up and um, I still have the same desire. So um, I, get, I don't know if that answered your question, but that's kind of what moves yeah. me. Well, let me let me ask one more question. Um, I know when you were running, you you committed to well, it was only two candidates in the November race that said the same things that if they won, they would actually donate mm -hmm. their salaries. One was you, the other one was Brad Jordan. And a lot of people didn't understand that. So Brad was like, What I make in a year if I win, I make that in 15 minutes. <laughs> Well, I can't. I want to donate it to somebody that needs it. I like Scarface. I've, oh I've, yeah, I got to meet that guy. Remember, you know the Ghetto Boys. Uh, that was the stuff. Okay, and I was at some house meeting, uh, and I was listening, and, and they were like, "We're not ready for you yet, Tony." And there was some council candidate talking. I was like, "Wait a minute, who is that over there? Who is that?" And I was like, that Brad Jordan. I said, you mean Scarface? Like, yeah, Scarface. I was like, I was starstruck because I love Scarface. Yeah, but people don't know. I was, I was, what I was going to do, and people were criticizing me for it, is I was going to give the salary to one person. And then they said, well, you shouldn't do that. You know, everybody wants to tell you how to spend your money. You know, that's people love to do that. Um, so then I said, okay, you know what I'll do is every month I will give it to a person who's doing something good. Or, or a cause that's doing something good for the city. <laughs> I had a lot of people text and email me, I tell you. Like, Tony, when you win, uh, consider me. Uh, but our, our mayor, what does he make, like 230000 Something like that? Something I mean, like that. That's a big salary for a city of Houston. Um, but, yeah, I, I, Scarface is right. I mean, he, the, um, the, 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 it, I wasn't obviously trying to be the mayor for the salary. That's not had anything to do with that um, or try to get my friends jobs or try to get my friends contracts with the city. I don't know anybody that does business with the city. And uh, I think I would have really, really did a real clean scrubbing of the city to make sure that the people that are getting the business deserve the business. Uh, I took big issue with the, uh, they have this um, office of business opportunity where you have the same con, you know, you have you have to qualify as let's say a minority contractor, and then you have the same minority contractor that in every bid, right? And then you have all these people, many of which are my clients, who never got a contract with the city, who 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 they never graduate anybody out of the program who's already you know got a guy. I, one example I, I put forward was there's this guy named um, Bobby Singh. This guy in Houston, who's a, one of the mayor's big fundraisers, who's in almost every contract as the minority contract, Indian contractor. That guy's a multi, multi millionaire. And then you got a guy who who has a, a mom and pop um, house renovation business who never got a contract, who should have, if we're trying to, you know, if that's the intention of the program. So things like that, I would have really enjoyed just turning upside down and making the city work the way I think that it's supposed to work. Well, we interact with our, with our audience. So I'm going to combine two people's question into one question. Okay. Terry Williams and Armand, they asked the question, what is your thoughts about how Trump is handling the pandemic, Turner and Hidalgo? Mm. Okay. Let me start with this premise. Um, Anybody that's in a position of power or administration, it's real easy for all of us to criticize them. And I remember when somebody, when they first closed the rodeo, uh, somebody said, Tony Busby would have never closed that rodeo. And you know what? I was thinking maybe I would have closed that rodeo. Um, and I have a hard time with somebody saying that, you know, I, ain't, I can't be forced to wear a mask when it's not just the person wearing the mask protection, it's the people that they're around. So I, as much as I have criticisms against Sylvester Turner, uh, and of course I have criticisms against the president and I have criticisms against Lena Hidalgo, I just don't, 
honestly don't, and I could easily do it. I mean, I could make good TV and I could make good radio by, you know, going after Lena Hidalgo and Sylvester Turner and Donald Trump. I just, I just won't do it. Um, I can tell you that I'm taking care of me and my family. Um, I think people, I don't think it's a bit too big of an inconvenience for somebody to put on a damn mask. Um, you know, uh, I, I wish I wish I had some solution that would make this all go away. But I, I hate to use the words the new normal because it sounds so cliche. But we're going to be dealing with this for a long, long time. And even if we get a vaccine, which would be the ultimate you know, deal killer for this for this particular vac- uh, virus, there's going to be another one. And, you know, I've been talking to my lawyers. I have a very large law firm and we've been talking about what is the new normal for practicing law? How are we going to actually run our business? I haven't been to my office in, in um, what, 60 days. Um, we sh- I shut down my office long before they did the, the uh, shelter in place, just because I was concerned about my own employees. Um, so I guess as, as much as I would like to, to go on a tangent and criticize uh, Sylvester Turner and the way he wears a mask, or Lena Hidalgo, and sometimes the way she wears a mask, or Donald Trump and the way he never wears a mask or uh, talk about their response to this crisis. I think everybody is kind of feeling their way through it. And I'm just not going to be in that position. Um, uh, I have thought about what I might have done differently, uh, but it's not really not fair to, to any of those three individuals. Um, I, part of being a leader, though, I think is is exuding some confidence that, hey, we got this we got this under control and here's what you need to do. I think that is probably lacking in the city of Houston and in um, Harris County. But again, um, I, I made it very clear when I lost that election that I'm not going to be the guy that's, I'm not going to be the Bill King who's, you know, sore grape, sour grapes is going to criticize the mayor for the next four years. I'm just, that's not, that's not the kind of guy I am. I got my own life. I didn't need to be the mayor. I offered myself up. I was not, selected. So I'm not sure that answered the question, but that's kind of where I am. on. I a question from Arthur Smith. You, you talking to me? I just see a question on the screen from uh, Arthur Smith. Yeah, he, he asked, Mr. Busby, what is your input about this Democratic versus Republican division in Houston, Texas? Man, I'll tell you, I'll tell you this. I think there should be a different, a, a new party, <laughs> to be honest. I think there should be, a, and I never, and I don't think there ever will be. It's been tried in the history. It never happened. Uh, you know, I tried a, an independent. And, you know, obviously, I made the runoff, but it, but it didn't work. And I think a lot of traditional Republicans, you know, fell, fell behind me and supported me. And a lot of Democrats rejected me because they thought I was Republican. Um, the city of Houston and uh, I think most city elections across the United States should be nonpartisan. You know, the city of Houston is is where the rubber meets the road. All the city uh, municipalities, that's where that's all the services that are provided to your, your everyday services, whether it be trash or roads or uh, your water. I mean, these are things that impact you the most. I don't think those are partisan issues. I, I really wish that the election that I was in had not been turned in such a partisan um, um, uh, circus, but it was. Um, I still, if you ask me right now, are you a Democrat or Republican? I would, I would just, I don't know if y'all seen that guy on uh, TikTok. That's what I would do. I don't have a choice. I mean, I could, I could tell you things about traditional Democratic values that I appreciate. I could tell you things about traditional rep- Republican values that I appreciate. Uh, but I'd be hard pressed to pick one side. And that's the problem. We shouldn't be picking a side, uh, especially when you're talking about city elections and even county elections. Um, and our judges, as another example. Um, obviously, I understand, you know, when you're talking about national elections, Congress and Senate and all that stuff, you know, there, there's a, a need for that. But I, I think it does a disservice to the city. Uh, what we should be we should be thinking about is, Who's going to be the best representative of the city? Who's going to advocate on behalf of the city? Who's going to serve the citizens 
the best, not, you know, whether this person is a Democrat or Republican. It's funny to me that that uh, Sylvester Turner uh, tagged me as being the Donald Trump Republican when I laying aside raised money for Sylvester Turner, but also was the Galveston County Democratic chairperson. Demetri? So I think everybody knows that one of the hot ticket items for this uh, whole election cycle is a black agenda. And so I want to ask you specifically, um, when you were running for mayor, did you have um, a plan for um, let's say, uh, more black neighborhoods like your Acres Home, Seawood, uh, Cashmere Gardens? Because from what I understand, I don't live out there, but it sounds like the roads are kind of messed up. Um, they have a lot of food buzzers and things like that. So did you have a plan uh, to help uh, spur economic growth in those neighborhoods and just make life um, a little bit better for the people who live there? I thought I did. I mean, I... I I may not have done a good job articulating it. You know, I got pushed. I got pushed so hard into the quote Republican camp that um, I mean, I was talking about those types of issues that because those are things I really care about. Um, when when I talk about uh, the uh, Office of Business Opportunity um, and how it has been hijacked by not only this mayor, but the, the, the previous mayor's cronies, where basically uh, small business people, small minority business people, small African-American business people have been frozen out of the system, totally frozen out. Um, and you got the same contractors over and over and over who never, never try to be the general contractor, always content to be the subcontractor and make sure that they're ever in every single bid so they never lose and they freeze out everybody else. So when you're talking about trying to, um, trying to, I don't want to say redevelop because there's always this this issue that I always talked about, which was when you talk about improving and developing a, a traditionally unserviced neighborhood, the first thing that people start saying is, "Wait a minute, I don't want my neighborhood gentrified. You know, I, I want to be able to work." live in my neighborhood that I've had, that I've been here, you know, my family's been here for two or three generations and I don't want a bunch of outsiders coming in and just pushing us out and making the neighborhood where it's unaffordable. So there's a, there's a very fine line and it's tough, but I talked about it a lot. So yeah, I had a plan. Um, I articulate, I had, I had it on my website. We talked a lot about it, but the truth is, uh, and you know, it, it was, it's, it's my fault. Ultimately, uh, when you're trying to communicate and you don't communicate effectively, it's always the communicator, not the receiver. Always. I learned that as a lawyer. If I fail to persuade somebody, it's not their fault. It's my fault. And I failed. Um, and again, I, and I've said it before, Turner did a really good job. I and mean, Turner was well known. His team was very skilled. And and so anytime I spoke about that thing, I think it, it fell on those kind of things that fell on deaf ears of people like, oh, wait a minute. No, you're the Trump guy. I don't want to hear anything you have to say, uh, even though I was talking about there's a reason that your roads are terrible. There's a reason that you don't have lights down your street. There's a reason that there's illegal dumping all over Third Ward, Acres Home, Fifth Ward. There's a reason because the city does not service these areas. There's a reason that the police. Uh, including my brother-in-law as a policeman, told me there's some streets I just don't go down uh, after night. There's a reason that, that uh, crime, uh, you know, the, the gang gang-related crime is is absolutely focused on some communities. And you know, go down, uh, you know, uh, Bissonette, which is where all the sexual trade goes on. Bissonette between uh, Beltway Eight and Highway Fifty Nine. You go down any night. You go down there tonight. There's uh, young women that are on on the streets who are involved in the sex, and and the city just turns a blind eye. And I talked about a lot of those things, um, and because there's a lot of people that are suffering that are not receiving the same city services uh, that we receive here where I'm sitting in River Oaks. You know, we have a not everybody can afford a private security service. Not everybody can afford a, a gate around their home like I have. Uh, you know, they're doing a, a um, and I'm not criticizing, I'm just saying they're doing a, a, a River Oaks Boulevard uh, rejuvenation where they raised $2 million in like 30 days so they could make the street look even prettier. And then you go, then you go down to, um, to Third Ward 
and you see the, how those streets are and you see the condition of the lights and the sidewalk and so forth, there's a major disparity. But I guess, and again, I, it was my failure. I didn't, I was not able to articulate uh, or to persuade appropriately folks that would trust me to say, you know what, you got, you got somebody here that has the ability and who has the credibility to go in there and change these. I could have, I could have brought, what I kept trying to say is that I have, there are people that had committed to me, you know, Tony, if you don't have the city finances, I can put together groups of 15 to 20 donors that can go instead of, in, in Houston, we have Buffalo Bayou Park, which run uh, parallel to Memorial and um, Allen Parkway, which were kind of one of the major arteries in, from the west side of town into Houston. There's a donor that lives probably four blocks from me right here that donated $50 million to renovate Buffalo Bayou Park. He's made it, I mean, beautiful. I could get 15 more people like that. The mayor should be able to go out and get 15 people like that to say, look, you care about this city? You want to attract Amazon to the world? You want to attract Teslas? You want to attract those? We need, we got to focus, laser focus on our schools. Don't tell me that the city has nothing to do with the school district. I Thank reject, you. I reject that. We Thank absolutely you. can make our school district where people want to move to the school district instead of out of the school district. Because what we have in, in a lot of major cities across the, across the country is we have uh People who want to have you have young professionals, you know, who want who are willing to live in a high rise and live in the city. If they want to have children, that's what they do. They want a house and they want a yard and they move out. And then we spend billions of dollars on freeways to bring them back into the city. And that's what we're doing. And we need to make and it's all about the school that starts with the school system. You know, obviously security all the basic services. I mean, you know how to make people feel safe where they live, but it starts with the school. And Sylvester Turner was very clear from, from the very beginning. Look, schools, the HISD, which is one of the largest school systems in the country, I don't manage it. I don't have a control over it. I can't change it. I rejected that. We absolutely, I could have brought donors in to, the, to transform in a just, just a huge transformation of the school system. I'm going to take the bullets for you on this one. All right. He said he don't have nothing to do with the school system, but there's the same mayor that put a group of people together in City Hall that were willing to take over failing African-American schools and turn them into charter schools, but he don't have nothing to do with the school system. For profit charter schools. That's what he wanted to do. Exactly. Yeah, I reject that. I reject that out of hand. And I, I think any any mayor of any major city across the country, if, if he or she is really focused on making that city livable and a city that people want to move to, the first thing you do, I mean, and, and I don't know, you know, the, uh, everybody watching this or e even my uh, friends here that I'm looking at your faces. I have four kids. Uh, uh, my kids. Um, until I moved into Houston, went to public school. Where I lived was based on what school I could I could afford the house to get them into. Most young families with children, they move to, if they can, and understanding a lot of people can't. A lot of people are stuck where they are. But people want to, people that have children want to put their kids in the best school to give them the best chance of success. And that's why I think that the uh, HISD and the city of Houston are joined at the hip like Siamese twins, if you will. And if HISD is not successful, Houston will not ultimately be successful. And we've got to have somebody, a mayor, who doesn't say, uh, no, that's not my bailiwick. No, it is your bailiwick. That is your job. Do what you can do. You have resource. You got the Greater Houston Partnership, which is all the rich folks with all the, you know, the CEOs, all the so-called important people. Uh, you know, how many more galas do you need to have? Where is the gala for HISD? Why don't you go out and raise? Why don't you go out and raise ten or fifteen million for HISD and start a pilot program in Third Ward, right? And then start a program in Fifth Ward, and then go here, and then you know, I mean, th this that is long term. That's what makes the city of Houston a place where why why does 
Austin, Texas. Why are companies, you know, we heard Tesla is moving to Texas. You think they're even considering Houston? Nah, they're not considering. You know why? Workforce. That's what they'll say. Well, you don't have an educated workforce. HISD is a failing school. You have blah, blah. That's what they'll say. They need a mayor. Houston needs a mayor that says, wait, wait, uh, you know, congratulations on your new baby, uh, M Mr. Musk. I want you to come to Houston. Let me tell you why. Here's why I'm going to you, you can be successful in Houston, Texas. Uh, we, we miss a lot of that. I think I think that's one of the thing I, things I thought I offered. I hoped I offered. But you know, unfortunately, I fell short. Well, I, I tell you what, man, you just you just preached a sermon about city hall in the school district. I, I go to school board and I preach that same sermon all the time. So, Demetra. Um, well, I have something a little bit change of pace. What would you say your three keys to success are? Because obviously you're very successful. Whenever I get a chance to talk to someone who is um, very successful, I like to know what they recommend to at least get halfway to where they are. So what would you say your three keys to success are? Um, the, the number one, for me, I have a very inquisitive mind, and I'm not sure you can make yourself like that. Uh, and I think that's probably been the reason that that I, I like to know a lot about everything. Uh, but, you know, I tell the people that work for me, um, I can't teach hungry. I, uh, I can teach you how to practice law. I can teach you how to take a deposition. I can teach you how to, you know, read a balance sheet. I can teach you how to, how to, how to, you know, all the principles of management, but I can't teach you to be motivated for your own success. Uh, I you can't teach hungry and I'm hungry. Uh, even, even, you know, I've been, I've worked, uh, nine hours today sitting in one place working on, on a project that I'm working on that I'm very passionate about. Um, so hard work for me is, uh, is the key. Um, you know, if you're willing to put in the work, you know, you can, you can do anything. Uh, that's been proven time and time and time again. I'm a voracious reader. I love reading, uh, learning things. Uh, we are so blessed that, um, you know, you don't have to go to Harvard. You know, I'm a I'm a Texas A&M person. I went to University of Houston. I, di I didn't go to any fancy schools, but but I've had the benefit of reading uh, the books that those fancy people wrote or the classes that they give. You can get online now and you can take classes. Uh, they got something called the uh, I think it's called the Great Works, which is a, a website that you can. You can, if you want to learn history, you want to learn, I mean, anything you want to possibly learn, it's available for you at your fingertips um, that, that I don't think everybody takes advantage of. I mean, nowadays, you don't even, if you don't like to read, nowadays you can just listen to books. I mean, you right off your cell phone, you can listen to any book you want to possibly listen to. Um, so I read, uh, I read probably a book every day and a half. Um, and um, and and it ranges from, you know, I just finished a book called The Sea, The Sea, which is just somebody had recommended it. It's like a 1600 page book. It was just incredibly awesome. But also, you know, uh, two days ago, read a book about uh, Abraham Lincoln's last trial. So I, I really enjoy reading. I think, uh, you know, anytime, you know, rather than sitting in front of it. And of course, I love TV, too. I mean, we're also blessed with great TV. I mean. I've been watching that Michael Jordan uh, thing on ESPN. That is really, really, really good. Um, but so hard work, reading. And then, you know, I, I think it's very important for me personally. I like to meditate and take time for, you know, for yourself, whether it be, you know, working out or, or walking or, or meditating. Those are going to church, uh, spending time with, with your creator. Those are things that we sometimes we don't actually put on our calendar. You know, it's just something. But I always put that on my calendar. It's something that's important. Uh, it's just as important as reading a book. It's just as important having a, a, a Zoom call with my entire firm. So those are probably the three most important ones. But but I, I go back to this. I'll, I'll give you a little trick I used to do. Uh, you know, I, sometimes I would send an email to my entire uh, law firm. Um, over a hundred people, like at um, three thirty on a Friday afternoon, and I would wait and see who had responded first. 
you know, whoever responded on Friday, who responded on Saturday, who responded on Sunday, who responded on uh, afternoon on Monday. Then that told me a lot about how hungry and how motivated and how committed they were to, to our what we were trying to do. Um, so uh, one thing I've learned, if, if a guy like me, um, you know, who was a, I graduated with 60 people in my high school class and I wasn't even in top 10 percent. Um, you know, I, I, I got into Texas A&M and, and but for the fact that I got a ROTC scholarship, I wouldn't have went to college. I would have went. I probably would have enlisted in the Navy because um, they were at that point. They were providing like a thirty thousand dollar bonus, which is more money than I'd ever thought about. Um, and for a guy like me to now be where I am and to be asked on a show to talk about, to even be asked this question, anybody, anybody can do it. Anybody. Um, it just takes every single, there's a book, I think, let me see what it's called. I just finished it and it's, I recommend it to people because it, it made a good point. Um, there is a book called, Uh, Atomic Habits. It's a book called Atomic Habits, and it's written by a guy named James Clear. And I don't, I don't know anything about this person. It was a, it was a New York Times bestseller. Uh, but it talks about the habits that you develop in your life, and it's just small little changes. Like, let's say you wake up this morning and. Typically, you would spend two hours watching TV and say, you know what, I'm going to spend an hour and a half, but I'm going to spend 30 minutes reading a book about this. And just little small, because when you think about a ship, and anybody's ever been on a, a very large ship, I spent nine months on a ship once uh, when I was deployed. You know, it's just real small course changes that at the end of the journey, you're in a whole different country. It's the same thing. That's the whole gist of the book, which is small changes in your daily habits will make major changes in your life. And so I've always been one of these people that every morning when I wake like at 5 a.m., no matter how late I stay up and whatever I'm doing late night, 5 a.m., my eyes wake up and I'm ready, like, let's go. Um, and um, so I have kind of a verve uh, for life and what, you know, what's going to be next and uh, what it won't be is mayor of Houston. <laughs> Donovan, you get the last question, my friend. You guys are awesome. Hey, uh, yeah, hey, I, I, I've learned a lot. And like I said, uh, as a fellow uh, comrade in arms, I thank you for your service. But I, I asked a lot of leaders, you know, be it, you know, if you're elected or not, there's a lot of leaders in our community. Recently, there's been a uh, video that has surfaced, as I'm sure you've heard or saw, especially as an attorney, of a man that was gunned down while jogging. And uh, on, on, on one of my shows that I do here in California, you know, we, we talk about, you know, Bellani justice and all this other stuff. But, you know, as a black person, we constantly see these things happening to us and no leaders are out there speaking out. Uh, what is your, you know, just off the cuff, you know, you, you were in the Marine Corps, so you have a, a, a plethora of Marine Corps brothers from mm -hmm. all backgrounds. What is your take on the uh, recent shooting? You know what the first thing I thought about that was? I thought if I, if I were an African-American father and I had a son who was just going to, like, Dad, I'm going to go for a walk, I would be worried. And I hate, to be, I hate to say that. I hate to be like that. I hate to, I hate to believe that about the country we live in and about law enforcement or people that were in law enforcement, where at least two knuckleheads were one of them at least was in law enforcement. Uh, I, I just, it, I, I mean, I can't curse on your show, but I just, yes, you can. I just don't, I just don't get it, man. I don't, uh, you know, I, th I used to like, I think like, like we're making such progress. You know, when I, I was in the Marines, I didn't care what color you, we were all green. We were green. Right. I mean, I had to write a I had to write a letter. If one of my guys got killed, I don't care what color you want. I had to write a letter home. I don't want to write a letter home. You know, those guys relied upon me. I was a lieutenant and ultimately a captain. Seeing shit like that, man, it really, really bugs me. I don't know. And I wish I had some answer. I thought, I mean, this is 2020. 
It's 2020. And it ain't a Republican Democrat thing. And that's the problem I have with it. People try to make it a Republican Democrat thing. And all these people like, well, there's got to be some other video. Well, maybe he maybe he was in a he was in a construction site. We have a video of him in a construction site. What the hell does that have to do with him running down the street and getting shot and killed? I don't know, man. I wish I could. I wish I had some words of wisdom, but I will say it just as a as a if I if I were if I were uh, the the father of an African American young man, God, I would have to. I would be like you, young man. You have to protect yourself. There's things that you you just can't do. You can't do. I mean, you look at you look at some of the things that 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 that. Uh, and I hate. I don't want to make it racist, ra- ra- racial, but it is. And like, you know, like I've yelled at cops before. I've yelled at them like, hey, you blah, blah, blah. If I were African-American, I wouldn't do it. I'm just saying, I know that I might not, that not maybe be a popular opinion, but I wouldn't do it. I'd be very careful. Uh, and now tensions are such that they are. And it makes it even worse. And because not only are our citizens are going to be extra, you know, concerned, the cops are going to be on the edge too. And look at what we got. I mean, we just got, it's just, uh, I wish I, I hope you see the, the level of, man, I don't know. It bothers me a lot. We're better than that as a people. We're a lot better than that. That's what I would say. Well, I tell you what, Tony, uh, you've enlightened us tonight. And I'm going to tell some of y'all out there with the crazy comments um, Something my father used to tell me. He say, boy, I don't hang around nobody that ain't got but $2 in their pocket because you ain't going to never get to a million. When a millionaire is speaking, shut your dumb ass up. <laughs> Please shut up when they're giving <laughs> you the game. I didn't get to see the comments. Am I missing the comments? Am I getting oh, right on the comments? You can go back. And you, got, you got a bunch of fans here. Yeah. A lot of people learning new, new things about you tonight. But when 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 a millionaire is telling you what it's gonna take, and excuse my friend, just shut your dumb ass up. You know what I you know what I'm looking forward to after this show? I got some new uh new special kind of cornmeal I bought out of Florida. I'm gonna go cook my son some fried chicken. So there you go. I tell you what, my friend, you you're a good dude in my book. Thank you. Um, we, we we need more good people in office, no matter what folk may think, no matter who they support. If they can get the job done, then that's what it is. If you ever run into a problem and you need a good attorney, I bet you'll call Tony and you wouldn't care if Trump was his friend or not. <laughs> so that's what it is. Thank you, my friend, for coming on. I'm going to I'm I'm inbox you. And he was one of the only candidates that embraced the 21 page plan that we had to slow down gun violence in the city of Houston. I'm going to say that in front of everybody. A lot of people wouldn't even listen to it, but he did. So thank you, my friend. And, and God bless you, man. Keep, keep pushing hard, man. Y'all have a good week. All right now. Bye bye. Now I'm back. When the man, shut your dumb ass up. (laughs) I'm dead serious, man. The man that told mm-hmm. you, you gotta read. You gotta and read. You know what they say? You can if he put a million dollars in a book, your black ass gonna miss it. Mm-hmm. But you ain't gonna read. I don't give a damn who he support. <laughs> so you 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 checking him because oh he supports Trump. Well, you support Turner, sorry. What? what the hell Turner doing for black people? I just had to get that off my chest, y'all. When a millionaire talking, shut your dumb broke ass up. I'll go find yeah, you. you know, I, I, yeah, you, you know, I, I will never understand Republican, Democrat, Trump, this, this, that. It's all one party. And, and we say that constantly. They get their money from the same people. You guys got to do your homework. If, uh, a Republican is going to do a better job to uh, improve my community. I'm voting for him, you know. And and if and if us as black people, we would stop. Just I'm a dem- I'm a Democrat. I'm a Democrat. I'm a Democrat, and start holding those Democrats accountable 
maybe we can get something done in our neighborhood because you know what? They're not concerned about our vote because they automatically got it. The congressional black talkers, these guys are like, what, 60, let's say there's 60 congressional members. And a lot of you guys will say, well, you know, you need a majority to move anything. Please explain to me how did Mitch McConnell obstruct Obama for six years in the minority? Nobody can upon is a Yeah, a pawn is a very powerful piece if it's moved intelligently. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm, you know what? When, when y'all was tripping and I'd hear, when y'all was tripping, I was on drilling rigs in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico with, with white guys from Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, and I knew what they were. But I would sit at them tables every day and I would eat with them. Didn't matter if they was racist or not. You feel what I'm saying? Because I can respect the man who's going to be who he needs to be. I can respect you. I don't have to, you know, agree with you, but I can respect you. Some of y'all done bought into this foolishness in this political thing. And then now you can see why we ain't got shit. If the white man can fix the streets in my neighborhood, the hell with your black politician. And I just want to ask Cynthia because Cynthia Funches, um, she's been on one the whole time about him being a Trump supporter and you know he's a liar and he can't be trusted and all this other stuff. But I want to ask you guys, since you guys are the only one that can answer back, who predominantly holds seats in black neighborhoods? It's usually Democrats, right? or black politicians, then ask yourself, has your neighborhood changed from let's say even 20 years ago? Has your, has your neighborhoods changed at all? Do you have you know better roles in uh, grocery stores and thriving black businesses and you know great education? If, you, if the answer is no, then how can you hold, and listen, I'm not saying Trump is a good guy because he's not, I'm not a Trump supporter, I am too nonpartisan but you can't keep pointing the finger at trump and the republicans when you cynthia because it's probably somebody like you keep voting in democrats and black democrats just out of symbolism and they ain't doing a goddamn thing for you not nothing and it's people like you who probably go and spread your nonsense to other people you know and then they believe the hype that they gotta uh, vote blue no matter who or we gotta vote blue all down ballot and then after the election is over, you don't have nothing to go home to. Your conditions are still the same. And so while you're pointing the finger at Trump, ask your politicians that hold seats in your neighborhood, what are they doing for you? I'm I'm just, you know, right now, we got a we got a black kid on the ground in Houston. Um, they don't want to le release the video footage from the Houston Police Department. And I said this before we came on and Tony was on, but I remember that there was a high speed chase in Bel Air and the, the something happened and, and maybe shots fired. And an hour after it happened, they had the video on the news. They're not showing the video. So what does your black mayor have to say about this black child? This black young man on the ground, and now all of a sudden, once again, we can't release the video. When something happens, no matter if it's flooding, whatever, we always got to go to the white Democrat or the white Republican. I don't give a damn what you say, who you support, whatever. My neighborhood has looked like it's looked for the last 30 years. The only reason we're getting upgrades is because of gentrification. They never gave a damn about Emancipation Park until they decided we're going to make it for the white people. We didn't have no bike trails over there. Midtown wasn't Midtown until they decided to make it for somebody else. So where's our black elected officials? And I'm going to tell anybody that want to do this because I'm serious about this. This is a great platform. And I'm not talking to, to, to Cynthia. I'm talking to everybody. Don't bring your ignorant ass on here with that dumb shit no more. 
If you ain't got the guts to come sit on this motherfucker, then don't don't open your mouth, man, if you can't say the right thing. I don't give a damn if he supported Trump. I don't see no black politicians giving away a thousand bicycles every year. I don't see no black politicians, you know, uh, selling exotic cars and giving the money to a homeless shelter. If anything, they trying to steal a car. I'm good. I want to address Wanda because I see Wanda's back. How you doing, Wanda? Uh, <laughs> hey, 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 be careful. That's my mom's name now. Uh, I, I, I might go out. <laughs> I want to make sure that wasn't your mama before I went too far <laughs> so to the left. Um, so Wanda says, be careful, Cynthia. You'll be called an exceptional Negro uh, for having a difference of opinion. No, Cynthia doesn't have a difference of opinion. She has a typical opinion of people who are caught up on symbolisms. And she doesn't need someone like you who at this point, I believe you do believe you're an exceptional Negro. She doesn't need somebody like you to egg her on. What she needs is somebody to educate her so that wherever she lives can be improved, that they can get results. She doesn't need to be hanging on symbolism. I got to vote for a black Democrat. She needs somebody to, tr to really give her the education and you're not doing her or anybody like her a good service by you know feeding her uh, stuff out of your ego. Tell her the truth so that she can make better decisions when it comes to politics. That's, I mean, I don't like, I don't know what your ax to grind is here, but you actually wanted a part of the problem. I'm gonna call you out on that. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, if, if you guys were listening to what Mr. Bisbee was saying, what Tony was saying, was he was just as poor as anybody else, mm -hmm. wherever he came from. Went to a, you know, regular, college, whatever, but how did he get his money? How did he get his start? And I'm not saying everybody, this is the path you need to go, but I think it's a crime when he has a blueprint of how he does it. I was given a blueprint of how I would go and educate myself if I don't have the money. So he joined the Marine Corps. And, and let me tell you guys something about the Marine Corps. My father was a Marine, my brother was a Marine, and my mom was in the army. I, I come from a long list of military people. To be a Marine and to take the money, do what he had to do. He was in infantry, which is, he, he could have been in the JAG Corps if he wanted to, you know, just to be a straight lawyer, not be in, in infantry, but he went the long route. And along that route, he probably met some very influential people. So what I'm saying is when, when we tell our kids that are sitting in the fifth ward, they're not exceptional football players. They're not exceptional basketball players. They're not America's next top model. And there's no other option for them to go out. I'm not saying push them in the military, but if you don't want to incur that debt and you want to just go out and do certain things, because everybody in the military doesn't go to combat. And here's a guy that, that took a blueprint and he's a major, uh, the military paid for it. He's a uh, major lawyer in the Houston area. I mean, I was just like, what, a Marine? Those guys are dumb as rocks. And he did it. So that's I, I tell you what he didn't touch on that before, you know, the government decided to give these loans to these small businesses. He decided to give loans to small businesses mm -hmm. before the government even did it. See, we spend too much time trying to criticize people for the wrong reasons, man. Quit letting these people sway you. Stop letting these people sway the way that you think, man. So I, I, I look. If y'all got a problem with with anybody we bring on, let us know. And 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 I'll say this here: at least the white folk got the guts to come. Where you black politicians at? They ain't got the guts to show up here, cause they already know what they ain't done. So thank you, Mr. Tony Busby. You're welcome back to the war zone at any time. And I'll make sure tonight that I purge my friend list. Cause some of y'all, like Malcolm say, when the revolution start, you got to get rid of some of your own people. Tonight, I'm gonna get rid of some of y'all. Well, listen, I wouldn't say get rid of them. I would say to continue to try to educate them. Cause you know, everybody is not on the level of a lot of people on here. You know, some people really, just don't know. And I think 
anything we do, we should try to do it from a position of love first. You know, because we were all, and I'm not admonishing you, Gary, at all. I'm just making a point to people who are listening. Because at one point, we didn't know what we know. You know what I mean? And so right. I can assume that Cynthia really um, doesn't know. I don't want to call her um, uneducated. She probably just doesn't know, you know, the, the things in regards to Trump and all that other stuff and the Democrats. So that's our job, as they would call us the resurrectors, to, um, no offense to anybody, but wake up the dead. Because when you do that, then they start to open their eyes and they start to say, OK, I get it. Because I'll be honest with you, I was a Democrat, too. Years ago, I was I'm voting mm -hmm. all Democrat. I was there, too. And then my eyes began to open and I started to learn things that I didn't know. I didn't know. So I wouldn't say that you delete them unless they're just downright disrespectful. They need to keep coming back so they can keep getting the information because when she gets it then she's going to go and teach other people around her. And then it spreads, right? It spreads like the coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you what to do, obviously, on your page, but I'm just making a suggestion. Well, well, you know, well, at, the end, ahead, at the end, yeah, at, at the end of the day, regardless if you like what is being said and you like the guests that are, that are here or not, you're putting a seed in everybody's head no matter which way it goes. So, you know, kudos to you, Jerry, for just, you know, putting it out there and challenging these people to read what, what these other people are saying. Well, I tell you what, Tony was a great guest. Love having him. Tomorrow, let's see if you complain about this one. Do you know who Derek Dixon is? Derek Dixon, affectionately known as D Rec, the CEO of Rec Shop Records, with artists like Big Pokey, Pimp Tight, ESG, Fat Pat, and last but not least, Big Mo. I hope you got your purple drink tomorrow, because tomorrow night we're bringing the originator of it into the building. So if you ain't from the hood, if you ain't never fired a sweet up, if you ain't never drunk no lean, tomorrow night's conversation is not for you. Because we going. Then to I the might room. stay home then. <laughs> now you stuck with us. You stuck with us. So tomorrow night, D Rec will be in the building, Rec Shop Records. If you a true Big Mo fan, Big Pokey, Fat Pat, you going to be in the building with us, baby. I want to thank my guest, Tony Busby, my co-host, Donovan Sadiq. She had to spank you on your ass tonight, Demetra K. And I am the five-star general. i see you tomorrow.